Carl Sagan's pale blue dot speech resonates with us to this day for many reasons. But if you look at that picture of Earth from the Voyager 1 spacecraft as it was exiting our solar system, one thing that stands out is that our planet is blue due to water, and that water is what makes us possible as well. Not long after he gave that famous speech, astronomers would announce to the world that they had discovered the first confirmed exoplanet. It was no pale blue dot. Instead, it was orbiting a pulsar, a very different harsh environment indeed, and not likely to be a pale blue dot. And subsequent exoplanets have shown us that the vast majority are nothing like this world. Our dot seemed special, but perhaps that's about to change. My guest and his team have discovered water vapor in the atmosphere of K218b, an Earth-like exoplanet. But just how much like Earth is it? And does having water mean this planet, like our own, can be a host to life? Welcome to Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. episode, John is joined by Dr. Angelos Tsiaris. Dr. Tsiaris is a research associate at the University College London in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. His work focuses on observations of exoplanetary systems, data analysis, data simulations, photometry, spectroscopy, exoplanet characterization, and modeling of light curves from exoplanetary systems. He and his team recently published findings in Nature regarding the finding of water vapor in the atmosphere of an Earth-like planet. Welcome everyone to Event Horizon with me, John Michael Godier. If you enjoy what you hear, fall into the Event Horizon, hit the like button, and become an active subscriber by ringing the bell. Angelo Ciaris, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. Now, Dr. You've recently authored a paper, co-authored a paper, on a very interesting exoplanet, K218b. What makes this planet different than the myriad other exoplanets that we seem to discover all the time nowadays? This is one of the few planets that lies within the habitable zone of its star. This is an area where the planet can support liquid water. Now, on top of everything else, this is the first planet within the habitable zone that we can say that it has water, because if the planet is in the habitable zone, doesn't mean that it has indeed water. For example, Mars is within the habitable zone, could support liquid water, but it doesn't have oceans, as we know. So, yeah, this is uh, the first planet with the correct temperature and with water in its atmosphere. That's, that makes it really exciting. Now, what techniques were used to determine that there's water vapor in the atmosphere of this planet? The technique we are using to characterize exoplanets uh, is called the transit spectroscopy. So in this technique, we are studying the light of the star as it passes through the atmosphere of the planet. This happens when the planet is going in front of the star. You can imagine a, as, it, as a fly going in front of a lamp, and we're trying to determine the, the color of the wings of the fly. So as the, as the planet passes in front, of its parent star, yes. it, light is being filtered through the atmosphere of the exoplanet, and that's where you see the absorption lines of like the water vapor, correct? Yes, correct. Although molecules do not, um, they have so many absorption lines that to us they look like absorption bands, not really small uh, and thin lines as you would see for elements. Now, did you see anything else? Any, are there any other gases or anything that you were able to identify in the atmospheric makeup of this world? So we use the data obtained by the Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, right now, the capabilities of uh, Hubble a are quite uh, limited in this. So we are observing only a very li limited range uh, of the wavelength of spectrum. And uh, at this uh, wavelength range, uh, we can only see the signature of water. It's very difficult to see anything else. 
to see more molecules with like wider wavelength coverage that, that uh, for example, James Webb can give us. Water vapor has been seen before, most notably, I think, in, in a brown dwarf. But this planet is a little bit different because it's in the habitable zone of its star, meaning that its temperatures are something like Earth, perhaps. How close can we characterize that? I mean, do we have an answer on just what this planet is really like? I mean, is it just sort of a, a general thing where maybe it's a rocky world, a giant super Earth, or maybe it's a another Neptune type world? But can we, are we going to be able to nail down what more about this planet is, things like James Webb come online? I believe so. But water has been found, you're right, water has been found before, uh, but uh, only on gases, exoplanets, uh, like Jupiter or Neptune. This is, a, this is a different planet. It has a mass of around eight times the mass of the Earth and radius twice the radius of the Earth. Given models for interiors, this has a this is a density density closer to Mars and uh, the Moon, so it is closer to to a bigger size uh, Earth ra rather than a smaller version of Neptune. Uh, however, we will need uh, more studies to uh, to me to be sure if there is a surface or not. But it's closer to the case of a scaled up Earth, to my opinion, at least. Now that that's interesting because I mean that. That's where it starts. I mean, it would be much larger than Earth, but that's where it starts looking more Earth-like, really. Now, could we have more than just vapor in the atmosphere of this world, at least? Could we have droplets? Well, we have uh, one. So given the data right now, we cannot really say whether there are clouds or not. Uh, so one of the models that we use to explain what we see uh, includes clouds, of course. Uh, we cannot say what the clouds are made of, but if there is a lot of water in the atmosphere, then probably there are also water clouds. So possibly, now what what would be putting the water into the atmosphere? I mean, do you actually have to have a surface with liquid water to produce this, or can this just be happen independently in the atmosphere of the exoplanet? No, it's not necessary to have a liquid water on the surface. These are two different things. This is because uh, the, the conditions may not be right. If there is a surface, the conditions may not be right for water to exist in liquid water. We say that the temperature is correct, but in order to be sure that the, the conditions are right, we also need to know the structure of the temperature, something that is much more complicated than, we, than what we can do right now. Now, one aspect of this is that the star that it's orbiting is an M-type red dwarf, right? True, yes. Now, these have been sort of falling down the probability scale of, of being able to have habitable zones where you could actually have a planet. Does the liquid water or the, the water vapor in this atmosphere of this world, does that change that landscape? I mean, shouldn't it be getting broken down by the ultraviolet from the star? Or is, is it, you know, is this a game changer of that? So this is a star uh, that has a temperature of uh, 3,500 Kelvin is not as active as, for example, the star that is hosting the Trappist planets. This star, this star is much worse, much cooler and more active. So for this particular one, we don't find any signs of strong activity. And so this means that it is not as hostile as uh, other uh, M-dwarfs. However, you're right that uh, on average, the, the, the radiation there is, is worse and uh, one uh, question that we had uh, earlier before this discovery is whether actually we can have water vapor in the atmospheres of these planets. We were not sure. Some uh, theorists were saying, yes, we can. Some others maybe were questioning this. But now we have one case. So next step is to try and explain why we see water there. And uh, of course, this will give us more uh, a better actually picture of the statistics on how possible it is to have water vapor in the atmospheres of uh, planets around red dwarfs. And the implication of that being that if at least some red dwarfs could um, have habitable zones that could support life, then that is a lot of stars. You know, that's the majority of the stars in the universe are red dwarfs. So that's, that really opens up a lot of possibilities, right? Indeed, the red dwarfs are the most common stars and super Earths uh, are the most common planets. So if you combine these two, uh, I think that we will have uh, many more to come in the near future, especially with uh, the discoveries from TESS. And uh, if uh, uh, 
uh, Hubble is uh, healthy and keeps going, we may be able to observe more uh, planets with water in habitable zones and have uh, have and start having uh, maybe a, a sample of this. Of course, it's still uh, early to have good statistics on atmospheres, but uh, we are getting there. Of course, if you have one, then you're probably very likely going to find many, right? Exactly. Why not? <laughs> if there's why one. not? Yeah. If there's <laughs> one, why not more? Now, what instruments are, are coming that are going to help you study this this exoplanet? You mentioned, of course, Hubble, but how long, you know we don't know how much longer Hubble's going to be with us, and we know James Webb will will offer some insight. But what else is there that can be used in the future to study this planet? Right now, we know that uh, there will be also the Ariel uh, Space Mission, which is a European mission to study th- a thousand exoplanets. But uh, mm, there isn't uh, something else that is uh, r- right now on track for space. From the ground, with the new next generation of uh, very large telescopes, we may be able to see other the existence of other molecules in the atmospheres uh, of uh, such uh, planets. But uh, not with with the the current ones, it's very difficult, but with uh, the larger next generation of uh, ground-based telescopes, I think that we will be able to to see more molecules. Now, as as study continues on this this planet, or one like it, and we start seeing other gases, as you mentioned, say we see something like methane or oxygen— I mean, is there any way we could tell if there may be something more going on here than just water? A biosignature, so to speak? Is that on the table with this, or is it just simply too far away, or do you think it's going to be possible? I think it will be possible to find uh, methane, uh, even with James Webb also. We, we know that if methane is there, we will be able to see it. Uh, now, for other biosignatures, that will probably require more observations, and I don't know if that will be possible, but uh, why not? If we spend the correct amount of time, uh, I think it will be we will be able to see if there are uh, biosignatures. However, biosignature is there is a debate on what a biosignature is. In general, we will start considering of biosignatures uh, in the case where we see molecules that we don't expect to find on a particular planet. This is an example for for, uh, for Earth and methane. So methane was not expected to these amounts if there was no life on Earth. This is a very good example to think about. Another aspect of this world is hydrogen. Now, you also found some evidence of a a hydrogen presence. Maybe, I mean, some people have said an envelope, but is that, what's your sense of that? What do you think is going on here as far as hydrogen goes? So we don't see any signature from hydrogen directly, but in order to explain what we see and to explain why do we see this strong feature of water, we believe that there is uh, some hydrogen and helium in the atmosphere of the planet that help us see through the atmosphere. Now, this envelope is probably remnant of the formation of the planet. And so planets that have uh, this high mass, in this case about eight uh, times of the Earth, can uh, actually hold part of their atmosphere as they evolve. While if you have smaller planets, they lose their initial gaseous envelope. Given that this is a bigger planet and more massive planet, uh, I believe this not, what happened here is that it has retained some of its uh, initial gaseous envelope, where hydrogen and helium, of course, they were there. How old is the system? Do you have any sense on when this, this formed? Uh, I, oh, no, I don't have personally, no, I haven't looked it up, to be honest. <laughs> There, the other option here is, what about carbon dioxide? Because if you can see carbon dioxide, then you can sort of say, is this a Venus-like world with, you know, maybe a hothouse world or something like that? Or has that already been eliminated? Or is it, I mean, so can we eliminate if it's Venus-like? Well, uh, I think that if it was Venus-like, we wouldn't see so much water. That's true. But, I mean, early in Venus's history, I mean, if, if it had, if it indeed had a liquid water ocean, there was a time where the water vapor was the greenhouse gas <laughs> that's, that was driving the, the issues. So This is true. This is true. We will, we will see, probably with James Webb, that will be our opportunity to see more. If anything, this is going to be a fascinating planet to watch for the evolution of planets, because given that it's a super Earth and we don't have one in the solar system, at least that we know of, And given that it's in the habitable zone, it's a sort of um, spotlight on a completely different kind of world, yet we're the odd 
we're the odd solar system out here that these these seem to be very common worlds so it's it it seems to me to be a great opportunity for insight on that whole class of planet you're right we don't have this kind of planets in the solar system and actually this is uh, i think where the debate comes from we don't know we don't have an example to compare so we are not sure what are they made of or how they look like what is the structure of these planets we don't know much so everything is based on uh, models however uh, Right now, without an atmospheric study, we only know the mass and the radius of the planet, so the density. And if you consider we have the same, uh, as humans, we have the same density as salty water. Uh, we are not the same as salty water, obviously. So the density alone cannot tell us what a planet is. Having information on the atmosphere, of how big the atmosphere is, that's mainly this thing, uh, will help us understand more about the composition of the interior of the planet and of course again where the, the whether it has a surface or not so there there are a lot of things to to be done and we don't have m many much information right now but uh, it's a really exciting field and uh, it's just our first steps towards understanding what super earths are what's next for you are you going to continue studying k218b or are you going to look for others we we would like to try and explain what we see, uh, but uh, I am more uh, on the data analysis, so I, <laughs> I'm working mainly on the data side. So the most important thing is to try and observe more of these kind of planets. We would like to have a sample. We would like to have a sample, uh, as we said before, because more than one will be even better than with just one. Right, and, it, and they've got to be out there. You know, there's just no reason to say that they aren't. We're just waiting for Tess to find more. Yeah. <laughs> and Tess is... They're coming. They're, they're, Tess is certainly, yeah, Tess is cut. <laughs> they're on the production line. <laughs> yes, they are. And I, I and I have very high hopes for Tess because it's already Me producing. Too. And what Me a wonderful... Uh, I had missed the capability of Kepler, you know, with transits. And then now we have this somewhat more capable instrument to replace it. It's really amazing times to live in. Uh, Hubble, uh, Kepler had a completely different job to do. The, with Kepler, we actually understood that almost every planet has a, every star has a planet. We didn't know that it wasn't it wasn't taken for granted a decade ago. Uh, now we know that planets everywhere, and uh, we're just going after them. <laughs> right now, it's just a matter of picking and choosing, sort of like like apples off of a tree yes <laughs> <laughs> well doctor we're looking for the best ones yes looking for the best the best shiniest apple um it's been a pleasure to talk to you and i wish you well and i can't wait until you find something else about this world or even another one thank you so much it was a very pleasure to talk to you okay thank you doctor so what's next now that we have found evidence of water on an exoplanet the search for life even microbial life intensifies but it also shows that it may be harder than we thought Distinguishing whether or not an exoplanet is giving off a biosignature over other non-biological processes seems to be the next major hurdle, and we may want to look into our own backyard for answers. Moons like Europa and Enceladus give off tantalizing hints that they may have liquid water, icy pale white dots with blue underneath, and then there's orange smoggy Titan. Mars as well has many unanswered questions, a red dot that was once blue, such as tantalizing methane blooms. No matter what all this means, the next steps in the search for life are bound to change our way of thinking very dramatically. You've got email. John, you've received an email titled, Cheap Car Parts for Sale. That's fantastic! Talk about just what I needed. Okay, well, well, well. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, sorry, John. I see Caesar is 78 degrees to have been infected with a tilba from the late late 1990s what and sunny 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 outside would you like to search with Urkel? yet another problem to fix i think i need a pastry first and on that note join me next week as my guest is dr becky smethurst dr becky where we get to discuss her new book and all sorts of interesting things about space you really should know see you then